uh, hang on. Recording is in progress. I got the message. Just, there we go. Just trying to get my screen cleaned up so I can focus. Uh, great. So uh, with your theme of climate change and marine policy for this lecture series, I'm going to talk about a specific area that I've been interested in for a long time, and that is uh, what do we do with fisheries management as climate is changing? Uh, there's all kinds of things that, that um, consequences that that triggers. So let's get started. Uh, so my first disclaimer is uh, uh, we could do many, many more lectures just on climate change and marine ecosystems. We could do many, many more lectures just on fishery management. Um, so with the constraints of, of time uh, and just to tee up my case studies, I'm going to go very briefly over the issues of climate change, impacts on marine ecosystems in the Gulf of Maine, and give you what I call Federal Fishery Management 101, uh, which will set up the case studies. I'm going to go through three case studies today to illustrate some of the issues raised by impacts of climate change on fisheries management. Uh, Southern New England lobster, longfin squid, and Atlantic cod. And then a few uh, maybe harebrained ideas for how we might need to think about fisheries management in the future. So just by way of introduction, um, this is my brain. Um, as Becky mentioned, I come from a biology and a law background. Um, I feel very privileged to work in the position that I have at University of New England, which is um, talking to students and working with students who love the ocean, they wanna do something in the ocean, but they don't necessarily wanna be the scientist, which is exactly the position I was in when I was an undergrad. Uh, so I like to think in this Venn diagram area where the law and the policy intersect with the science and the communication, the education, the outreach and the management piece. Um, just a few pictures of some of my favorite students. They do outreach and education. Uh, Shay over on the left-hand side is at um, the uh, uh, Odeon Point Marine Lab down in New Hampshire. Um, Another student there who was interning at Friends of Casco Bay uh, and went to the legislature. She was super excited about that. Uh, and another student there who worked on some soft shell clam legislative issues. So here's how I got into this. I've been thinking about this issue for several years. Um, and my overarching research questions are, what happens with marine resources as our climate conditions are changing? How do we then need to think about our existing marine resource management laws and policies as the environment is changing? And what are the choices and options that we have for managing both the resources and the human communities that are dependent on them as the climate changes? And, and the big thing is that we are facing much more uncertainty. So as I've done this work, I've uh, done a couple of publications, a uh, couple of presentations as you, as you see there, and I'll be adding the Kelt one after tonight to that list. Okay, so climate change uh, poses a number of challenges for marine ecosystems. Uh, waters are becoming warmer, there's less oxygen, it's more acidic. Again, we could spend many hours talking about any one of these particular impacts, whether it's coral bleaching or toxic algae, ocean acidification. Uh, so a variety of impacts from climate change. Specific to marine life, and as we're starting to talk specifically about fisheries, the fish that we like to eat on a plate, uh, we have warming waters, more acidic waters. One of the big challenges we're facing in the Gulf of Maine is how this is changing the circulation within the Gulf. And this has just a cascade of effects on the ecosystem. So species are moving in and out of their preferred ranges and habitats relationships between the types of food sources that organisms are used to obtaining uh, and predator-prey relationships are changing. Uh, organisms are increasingly vulnerable to disease and pollution. Um, as waters warm, their metabolism increases. As they're having to roam further and further to find their preferred food, uh, it just makes them more sus susceptible to stress, such as disease and impacts from pollution. And finally, you know, again, if you think about it, it's kind of the house of cards. You, you tug on one piece and everything is impacted. So we're really seeing some uh, big changes to our overall ecosystem structure. So we've been thinking about what's happening to fish in the Gulf of Maine for quite a while. Uh, Dr. Janet Nye uh, was the lead author on a study published in 2009, 
looking uh, at 36 species, uh, fish species in the Gulf of Maine over a 40 year time frame and hypothesized this shift. Uh, guess what? They're going north and they're going offshore to stay within their preferred temperature and habitat range. So just the facts, I'm totally dating myself with this slide. Anybody who recognizes that uh, knows what I'm talking about. Uh, but the Gulf of Maine uh, is warming faster than pretty much any piece of the ocean in the world. Uh, so we are seeing this happen in real time. It's not a theoretical uh, impact at all. We know this is impacting our fishery stocks. Uh, they are definitely being affected by these climate driven changes. We're seeing these changes in ecological boundaries. We're also seeing that the historical data that we've been using for a long time to try to forecast how many fish are gonna be out there, how many we can catch on any given year. It's just less and less reliable because conditions are changing. And finally, this is putting fishermen in a really interesting spot because they have access to a certain species. Uh, they have a certain amount of that species they can catch. They have a certain place and a certain way they can catch that species. They may not be able to do that in the future, but they may not yet have legal access to the new species that may be moving in. So a number of facts. If you need, there's any number of graphs. I just have cherry picked a few here. Uh, so this is showing a clear trend uh, from Andy Pershing's 2015 publication on warming in the Gulf of Maine. You see the trend, it's going one direction and you see the red highlighted in that global map. Uh, just honing in a bit more, uh, again, you see that that uh, thin line is the zigs and zags over uh, an annual basis. Uh, the darker line is showing you the trend. And if we were to smooth that out, uh, we would see a clear upward trajectory, particularly uh, since the beginning of this century, around the early 2000s. Well, I've come up with my own rules. This is totally unofficial, but it's just uh, what I've, I've come to think about when I think about the impacts of uh, climate change on fisheries management. Uh, history isn't reliable anymore because the conditions that we're facing now and we'll be facing in the future are not like the ones that historical data is based on. Geography doesn't really matter anymore, at least the geography that we're used to thinking about, the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank and the Mid-Atlantic, uh, because uh, the conditions are changing and making those boundaries just less and less meaningful. And finally, uh, if there's anything we know about climate change is that it's not going to happen steadily and predictably. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many Mainers or New Englanders or people from other parts of the country or the world are on tonight, but uh, it's been a roller coaster this fall, fall and winter. We've had really mild temperatures, we've had frigid temperatures, we've had rain, we've had snow. It is not the way that winter used to be not too long ago. Is this a blip? Is this a trend? Um, so this is part of what makes figuring out how to manage natural resources under these changing conditions challenging. All right, so a few of the implications for fisheries management with climate change is uh, one, scientific uncertainty is really, really increased. There's always scientific uncertainty. Scientists hate to be made to say something with any degree of certainty because that's the scientific method, right? There's always more to discover. There's always new innovations and new frontiers of knowledge. Uh, but climate change is really putting that uncertainty on steroids. Our management system, our system of laws and policies and regulation uh, isn't changing as quickly as the conditions out there are. This means that managers are constrained in what they can do. This also really hinders the fishing industry's ability to make plans and fishing communities to figure out how they're gonna be sustainable going forward. And finally, and again, this is my lawyer, uh, my lawyer hat coming out. Um, you know, we have a system of law that has governed fisheries management for many years. Maybe we think it's done a good job. Maybe we think it's done a bad job, but it's like the glass slipper on the stepsister's foot. It simply just doesn't fit the conditions that we're confronting anymore. Well, none of this is happening in a vacuum. Uh, part of why I, I really have enjoyed studying and being engaged in fisheries management in New England over, uh, over the course of my career is because it is such a storied industry. Um, there are people involved, there's culture involved. Uh, Vikings were fishing here. Uh, foreign countries were fishing here long before 
uh, white people came and colonized the United States. Um, if we were in person, I would ask if anybody knew what that uh, goldfish was down in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, it's the gilded cod and it hangs in the state house of uh, the capital of Massachusetts in Boston because cod was so essential and so important to the founding and the development of our nation. Well, the current uh, context that we have in, uh, in New England and in oceans all over the world is that uh, we're looking to our oceans more and more for a more diverse set of uses to support us. Uh, so things like renewable energy, offshore wind, which is part of the solution to climate change, right? Uh, but that's a new use. It's going to displace current uses. There's a lot of questions about impacts, a lot of questions about how you figure out where's the right place to put that kind of use. As we're seeing more and more coastal erosion, uh, we're seeing more demands for offshore sand and gravel. You can see that image in the in the top off to the right there. Uh, and, and this is again, is a new industrial use out in the ocean. Uh, finally, there's more and more uh, demands and conversation about uh, more protein coming from the ocean, whether it's finfish aquaculture, shellfish aquaculture, seaweed aquaculture. Again, all these uses uh, aren't happening in a vacuum. Fisheries aren't happening in a vacuum. So it's a, it's a busy place out there. But a lot of people think the ocean looks like this. It's flat and blue, there's no boundaries, uh, it's endless. So my, my, my college students would be really cross that I'm just showing you one slide to talk about this issue because I have this whole semester where we talk about ocean governance. There's a lot of lines out there. There's lines about state waters versus federal waters. There's differences between how states think about uh, what is private, intertidal land and what is public intertidal land. So the flat blue idea, not so much. We've been carving up the ocean in lots of ways for a long time. Boundaries are important for fisheries management for a few reasons. Uh, the first thing is it helps determine who's in charge. Um, and we always like to know who's in charge, right? So within state waters, that's from the shore out to three nautical miles and state laws control. For purposes of, again, with just one, one hour to go in this, in this presentation, I'm focusing my case studies on two species that are managed under federal law and one that's managed under interstate management. So I'm focusing on federal waters. Um, again, we can spend time uh, in any number of lectures on other issues, uh, but that's what I'm gonna be focusing on today. There's also ecosystem boundaries. Uh, that feed into our fisheries management system. Uh, we talk about the Mid-Atlantic, we talk about the Gulf of Maine ecosystem, the offshore Georgia's bank ecosystem. And finally, you know, management is a way of, of setting the standards, setting the criteria, if you will. We take in the science information, we apply it to the standards that are in the law. Uh, we have a vigorous democratic process and particularly in fisheries, this, this sort of vigorous process can play a big role in how management decisions are made. So in federal waters, we have the Magnuson-Stevens Act. It was passed in 1976. Again, my students will be very grumpy because we spend way more time in class on how Magnuson works, uh, but you're only getting it in a couple of slides. So the, the, the quick version. Um, it's been amended a couple of times since it was initially passed. It is very much oriented about re around regional councils. Um, and this is important. And this is an important piece of, that got me thinking about how is this all gonna work? as conditions change out in the ocean. And these regions maybe don't really make sense anymore if they ever did. Uh, the way these councils work, they take in the science and they come up with different targets uh, for fishermen to, to meet in terms of what we can sustainably take out of a fishery population. Uh, it's kind of like how much interest you can take off of a bank account without disturbing the principal, right? You don't wanna, you don't wanna gut the principal. You just wanna keep sustainably taking the principal, the, interest off at the top. Another important part of fishery management is who gets to catch the fish, uh, whether it's by individuals, by groups, by permits, different types of allocation. Oftentimes it's based on how much they've caught in the past. There's different ways that people can exit and enter a fishery. Uh, it's highly regulated, it's complex. Uh, so it's this combination of uh, stakeholder engagement, science, law, um, and allocation among the participants. So here's the regional council 
uh, system looks super tidy, right? Uh, it's oriented around the states. There is some ecological basis in here. If you've spent any time in Long Island Sound, you know it's a really different ecosystem um, than Southern New England. Southern New England is super different than the Gulf of Maine. Um, so some of this makes sense. Some of this is just for convenience. But those are the regions that uh, fishery management is operating under at this point. And typically, uh, fishermen get a permit for a specific type of fishery. I just have an image here just for illustration purposes of a, a scallop, urchin, and sea cucumber license from the state of Maine. Uh, they go through that process to get that permit. Um, and again, the allocation piece is just, it's divvying up the pie. Who gets to catch what? And how much pie do you need to leave in the pan, if you will? So two really important things when we start thinking about the impacts of climate change on fishery management is geography is really important and history is really important. Geography is important because that helps us figure out where is the stock, who's in charge, who gets to catch it, if we're gonna put any kinds of area restrictions and closures in place to manage that stock, geography is very important. Um, the kelp members may recognize that map. I just grabbed that just for grins to show, to illustrate geography, but that's, uh, th those are your kelp properties. So, you know, you wanna know where your properties are and where you can hike and where you can ski and uh, who's in charge, right? So geography is important in lots of cases. History has traditionally been very important in fishery management because that's how we figure out how to project what to do in the future. We look at historical uh, stock basis and we try to project going forward. Well, how, how, how is the stock? How is it doing? What condition is it in? Is it overfished? Is it overfishing? Are we trying to rebuild it? Um, and that helps us forecast, well, okay, how much can we catch? And is there a point, is there a trigger when we need to change what we're doing and either reduce how much we're gonna catch, maybe have fewer fishermen participating in the fishery or maybe put a moratorium and shut the whole fishery down. Um, so, the history that's used to set up those targets and triggers has been a very important piece of fishery management thus far. So it's a combination of science. Uh, the NOAA vessels go out and do all kinds of surveys. Uh, the data gets crunched. There's all kinds of computer models that are, that are run. Um, and then you have a whole lot of public process at the fishery management council meetings where these decisions are made about the management regime going forward. All right, so let's get into the case studies. I have three here, and I think each of them illustrates a slightly uh, different issue uh, uh, presented by fisheries management in a climate changed environment. Um, I think there's probably lots of other case studies that these could apply to as well, but these are the ones that I'm looking at. So we're gonna talk about Southern New England lobster, which poses some questions of timeliness of management action. Uh, it also illustrates the difficult decisions that both managers, scientists, and fishermen are going to be facing in the future when a stock is not doing well. And it presents an interesting issue of when a stock is on, a move, on the move, should we think differently about both those pioneers that are in the front of the pack and the laggards that are in the back of the pack? Um, there's some, some science that says maybe we should instead of managing the whole stock as one. Next, we're going to talk about long fin squid, also known as loligo squid. This presents uh, a great example of what happens when things move and they're not where they used to be, but we haven't changed our management uh, and ge geographical boundaries to fit the conditions. Finally, we'll talk about Atlantic cod, which I think presents some interesting things to think about in terms of a reality check on how a fishery is really doing and how realistic and accurate we are about assessing the future of that fishery. All right, let's get started with Southern New England lobster. Uh, Southern New England lobster uh, crashed uh, in the late 1990s. Um, the, the, it was pretty precipitous, 70 to 90 percent compared to 1998. Uh, and there was an outbreak of shell disease. You can see the diseased lobsters at the bottom there. Shell disease doesn't kill a lobster. It makes it very unattractive for the market. It also makes them more vulnerable to other diseases uh, and infections. Uh, in Southern Massachusetts, in the time frame between 1998 and 2004, landings were down 50%. Um, and we know that lobster's been on the march for a while. 
um, the southern range of lobster has moved 43 miles north in the last decade. So you don't really think about lobsters moving very quickly. They have, and those, those maps uh, show you uh, that the maps are illustrating between 1990 and 2015, um, the recruitment or the baby lobsters that are coming into the stock and how much that has moved over time. You don't have any baby lobsters, you're not gonna have big lobsters, right? Just another uh, image of this, this shows three different species. Uh, I've highlighted the lobster for you uh, and you can see based on the, the sort of lighter tan and the darker tan, how they have been on the march heading north. Not good for Southern New England. Well, they're heading north, which has been good for the Gulf of Maine and for George's Bank. So on the left, you see that trend line for Gulf of Maine and George's Bank. And on the right, you see again, right starting in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, uh, that line just going down, 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 down with no, no upward trajectory at all. So what did this mean for management? In May of 2010, uh, scientists recommended a five-year fishing moratorium. In other words, close the whole fishery down for five years. By December, that had been modified to a recommendation of reducing landings by 50 to 75%. So we're going from shut the whole thing down to reduce by 50 to 75%, both really drastic, severe impacts on fisheries and fishing communities, right? By August of 2011, the recommendation was to reduce exploitation by 10%. And this was not because there was a fantastic rebound in the lobster population. This was a quote from one of the, uh, one of the managers involved in this decision, um, that the lobster stock was experiencing such profound environmental changes that all the rebuilding measures in the world weren't gonna matter anyway. So the managers were making an overt decision that what we need to do is just let the fishermen keep fishing as long as we can. It's the most humane way we can deal with this. Uh, to help the people that are still in that fishery transition to the next step. Things haven't improved. Um, by 2013, uh, guess what? We, there's no ability really for this resource to rebuild at all. Record lows in 2015. But there still is some attempt within management to try to, try to keep this stock and this fishery going. So in 2017, Managers approved a goal of increasing egg production by 5%. Based on the numbers that I showed you before, it doesn't sound like that's gonna do much of anything. Uh, managers actually rejected that goal because it wasn't gonna do enough. And here was one, one statement by one of the, uh, one of the managers. Uh, it's time to think a little differently about how we're managing lobsters in Southern New England. We know there are things we can do. This is 2017. Stock crashed, let's say 2000. Um, call for moratorium in 2010 and in 2017, they're now saying we could probably do things differently, perhaps. Um, and here's an, uh, a graph just showing you the landings. Um, if you're in Northern New England, if you're in Maine or the North Shore of Massachusetts, uh, you know, landings have been, have been going up pretty dramatically over this period of time as they've been plummeting in Southern New England. So what can we get from this case study? Well, I think this illustrates um, the issue of timeliness, okay? The science has been pretty clear for a long time what was going on with this stock. It's been collapsing over the course of 20 years um, and management has not been very active in terms of responding to it. Um, and I mean, I I, I'm not gonna argue one way or another whether it was the right thing to do to keep people fishing in that fishery as long as possible versus shutting it down completely in 2010, but at least they were upfront about it. We're making a, a overt decision. We're trading off the benefits of shutting down the fishery versus keeping it going in even in a skeletal fashion. But there is some science that tells us that as stocks are moving, You've got pioneers out on the front, you know, braving the new colder, deeper water. And you have some laggards in the back that are able to kind of hang on in the warmer change conditions. Um, if we left those laggards that are still hanging around Southern New England, if we didn't fish them at all, would that perhaps help the overall stock to, uh, to, to, to rebuild a little bit? It's kind of like this darn Omicron, right? Viruses evolve. And organisms evolve too. So if we left those organisms alone that are trying to evolve in response 
to either you know, warmer conditions or, uh, or colder conditions as they're heading north, maybe that might keep the overall stock more abundant and resilient. Um, generally, we just we manage stocks as one stock. Uh, but this, this idea of trailing and leading edges of stocks has been something that uh, some of the literature has been talking about in the last few years. All right, on to long fin squid. So the center of this stock has moved north. Uh, so it's located off the coast of Rhode Island and southern Massachusetts uh, over the course of the last 20 years. Um, Rhode Island has the largest squid fleet on the eastern seaboard. It's the most profitable fishery uh, in the state. Uh, the Port of Galilee is the number one port for these landings in the country. And I love this fact. This happened actually while I was living in Rhode Island. Uh, the Rhode Island legislature actually made calamari a state appetizer. If you've had Rhode Island version calamari. They're delicious, they're fried, they come with those little salty banana peppers, fantastic. Uh, but that's just, it sort of shows you the importance of this particular fishery to that state. Uh, little plug here, I've got the website down there, uh, oceanadapt.rutgers.edu. This is a really fun website. I didn't want to risk crashing. Um, the Zoom meeting and the internet connection. So I'm not gonna run any of these videos, but you can go onto that website and pick different species and watch the video show you where the stock is going. So I've just captured a couple of screenshots here. So this is uh, where the biomass for these long fin squid were in 1972. Here's how they've moved by 2019. 72, you see them kind of spread out, nice orangey sort of middle of the road color. Uh, fairly up and down the East Coast there, right? 2019, it's not so orangey up and down, and we have a whole bunch of red uh, right off the coast of Rhode Island. And the landings bear this out. Uh, so 2014, 2016, you see the total there on the right-hand side, and you see Rhode Island's contribution. It's consistently uh, at least an over half. How about more recently, 2020? Total landings were down a little bit compared to those previous years, uh, but Rhode Island is still catching the lion's share of that. Well, here's the problem. Longfin squid is managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. And you see that down in the map at the bottom of that slide. Rhode Island is not part of the Mid-Atlantic. Rhode Island is part of the New England Fisheries Management Council. Uh, so despite catching the, the majority of the, the fishery, uh, they don't have a say in the management. This has led to sort of a, I don't want to call it comical, um, but it's an interesting situation where uh, Rhode Island Senator Jack Reed repeatedly introduces legislation uh, for Rhode Island to have two seats at the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council to help participate in the longfin squid fishery. And there he is, even, uh, even uh, in October of 2020, uh, this is, he introduces this on a fairly regular basis. So what do we get out of this particular case study? So things have moved. The stock has moved, fishing behavior has changed, uh, but our management system is really inflexible. The Mid Atlantic manages that fishery it has for years and years, and we still do. Uh, and there's not a lot of nimbleness to say, you know what, it makes more sense for Rhode Island, even though they're technically part of the New England Council, to be part of this management regime. And then we have this kind of uh, interesting situation where we repeatedly have a senator introducing a bill over and over and over to just address this one particular state in this one particular fishery. Um, I'm just suggesting that this may be a situation that we're going to confront more uh, in the future, and maybe this piecemeal approach isn't the most efficient way to deal with that. All right, finally, let's go to cod. Um, Atlantic cod has been an iconic fishery, again, for centuries. Um, you got our gilded cod there in the Massachusetts State House. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of art ever is the Winslow Homer fog warning in the Marine uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. You can see that image there. Um, so, and it's also uh, in the course of my professional and personal career, it's been the source of much litigation and management dilemmas uh, for the past few decades. If we were in person, I would ask you, how many of you have heard of Captain's Courageous by Richard Kipling? How many of you have seen the movie with uh, Spencer Tracy in it? 
Um, my college students usually not so much. This, this audience perhaps might recognize that. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a great movie, number one. It's a great story, but it's a great movie. Uh, special effects don't look like anything of the special effects that we would expect now. Um, but it's a, it, it really captures the, um, the cultural importance of this fishery to New England. And that has persisted right up to modern times. There's an image of the modern, the modern fleet and a modern fisherman. Um, so this has retained its importance for, uh, for centuries in our part of the world. Well, uh, things have been changing. They've been on the move. Uh, so you can see again, the red, the hot, the hot colors in, indicate more cod. And you see over time how they've shifted uh, both uh, in, in, in expanse of their range um, and in, in concentration. So by this last slide uh, that Dr. Nye did, uh, looking at the range of cod in 2008, 2012, you really see much fewer cod, number one, and they've really contracted in terms of their range. They're really hunkered down in a couple of limited spots. So Dr. Kevin Freeland posed this question about is cod distribution changing? Well, you can see the same, same sort of thing. Again, fewer cod and really bunched up and concentrated in smaller areas. Here's the thing with cod. The Gulf of Maine is the southern limit of that stock. Um, has been for a long time, but conditions have supported it uh, to be a, 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 a robust fishery. But what we've encountered in the last 50 years, particularly in the last 20 and 30 years, um, is that we were not able to get this fishery to recover. Um, and we didn't realize soon enough how vulnerable this fishery was to uh, conditions related to climate change. So you can see on that graph, that red line is uh, a rebuilding target. And again, the law tells us that we need to, you know, when, when a stock is overfished, a fishery is depleted, we need to set a target to rebuild it. Um, so again, we got this downward trajectory. We're trying to get it back up to that. There's all kinds of lawsuits. There's all kinds of draconian management measures that are made and the stock is just not recovering. 2004, we take more science, plug it in there. We say, here's where, here's what's going to happen when we rebuild. Doesn't happen. It's still going down. We're trying again in 2014. We're projecting we're going to be able to rebuild it uh, up to this level. Um, and you, you see, we're just, we're bumping along the bottom there. Um, so I think that the story of cod is complicated. Overfishing certainly contributed to the collapse. Uh, but we didn't recognize soon enough how sensitive they were to temperature and how that was going to limit uh, their, uh, their ability to reproduce uh, and their inability to really try to rebuild to these ambitious targets. So at this point, uh, this stock is predicted to be gone by the end of the century. Who knows, maybe sooner. And again, there's a number of things that have happened here. Um, I know one of the questions that came in advance of the talk today, which I really appreciate because I've got a bullet point right here. Um, we know that uh, zooplankton um, is also highly vulnerable to changes in temperature and acidity. Um, and just think about your traditional food web, you know, little critters on the, on the bottom, slightly bigger critters eat them and so on up the food chain. Um, so is, is there a prey issue that contributed to the decline? Perhaps, uh, but you can't see a, a fact like that about the, the low levels of, of zooplankton in the water and not think uh, that probably isn't good for a species that's already uh, not doing very well. So what can we learn from cod? I think the, the case study of cod, it illustrates a whole bunch of things, but the two things I'm gonna pull out of this related to climate change and fisheries management is that we, we did not have a good handle on what was really going on with that stock soon enough. Would we have acted differently if we had known about that sooner? I don't know. Um, again, I have heard a whole lot of argument about management of ground fish in Atlantic cod in New England over the years. Um, and it tends to get very polarized. Um, it's an important part of New England culture and heritage. Uh, there's been a lot of arguments and disputes about the reliability of the science um, and all that fed into uh, managers reluctance to take even stronger management measures than they did. And those were not well received as it was. Um, I have been at meetings where I've heard fishermen say, just shut us all down instead of, you know, managing us to death here, just shut it down. 
let's give it a chance to recover. Um, would that have changed the end of this story? I don't know. So, you know, I think we are, we're not only um, coming up to a fork in the road when it comes to how we're managing fisheries uh, in a climate change world, we're, we're, we're on it. Um, so what, what can we take out of all this? So from the management point of view, you know, at some point you get to this, the stage that you were at with Southern New England lobster and Atlantic cod, where again, a fishery just may not be viable anymore. Uh, we see the issue uh, illustrated by the long fin squat, long fin squid, excuse me, where, and the fish just move. They don't care about the boundaries. They're not looking at the map. Uh, they may go out of one area and jurisdiction into another. They may go back and forth. Um, again, history is less and less useful and reliable for us to use as a basis on future fishery management decisions. Um, all of this change is putting fishermen into a, a really interesting spot. They've got their set of permits. They've got their catch history to catch what they've been catching in a certain location. Um, as those species move, other species are going to come in, but the management system may not catch up enough and be nimble enough uh, to give those fishermen access to those new species. And the science may not support that either. Um, so again, you know, it, all this uh, really talks to me about uh, jurisdiction issues, about, about spaces and geography and history that may not really be useful anymore. Magnuson, again, is, is, is based heavily on geography, both with, in terms of the, not only just the regional councils, but how fishery science is conducted. Um, fishery management is largely single species management. We're not taking into account the whole system. We're managing cod, we're managing scallops, we're managing long fin squid. We're not thinking about the different predators on those organisms or the different prey bases that those organisms may need. Um, and, and we don't have in the law right now any triggers that help us react when species move in and out, when management boundaries aren't really very useful anymore, as in the case with the squid, um, and how to figure out when fishermen should come in and out of a fishery. Our science is also limited in a climate change world. Again, it's traditionally been heavily reliant on history as a way to make future predictions. And history is just less and less useful anymore. Um, if we're going to try to make decisions more quickly as conditions are changing and stocks are moving in and out of certain places, um, we need more real-time fishery data. Um, the fishery data tends to uh, take a while uh, before it's plugged into the management system and uh, the conditions are changing out there faster. We've always, there's been a lot of complaints about that in the past anyway, but I think it's becoming an even more um, even more of an obstacle going forward. I think it's also tricky in the science to figure out again, when, when is it a change and when is it, when is it a change a blip and when is it a trend? You know, is it just this year that we happen to see these black sea bass up here in the Gulf of Maine or are they here to stay? Are there enough of them here to stay that we can declare that a fishery and set up a permitting scheme, set up a scientific sampling scheme so we're doing it sustainably, or is this just a one-time thing? I think that's, that's a challenge science is trying to deal with. And finally, as we're thinking about all these different shifts within the ecosystem, our science has traditionally in fishery mismanagement not really been very comprehensive, again, in terms of thinking about predator-prey relationships and what's going on with the whole system. It's really focused on the particular species that is being uh, prosecuted within a given fishery. So these are some ideas. Um, some are wildly unrealistic, some maybe not so much. Uh, again, I think we need to think about science that is um, happening more in real time and is taking a more comprehensive look at the ecosystem. Uh, I think it's pretty clear we need to think more about a flexible management regime. We can't be wed to that mid-Atlantic New England boundary, you know, or that South Atlantic mid-Atlantic boundary when things are clearly moving. We can put science in there to identify stocks as being particularly vulnerable to climate change or perhaps more resilient. And that might help managers make uh, more informed decisions and fishermen make some more informed decisions as well. This is one of the wacky ones. Um, so we have a lot of boundaries out in the water that make no sense. 
three miles for state waters is not based on any scientific calculation. It's based on how far you could shoot a cannonball to defend your territory hundreds of years ago. Um, these, these arbitrary council regional uh, management uh, boundaries, they don't make a lot of sense either. We know critters are moving. We know conditions are changing. We know the ocean bottom isn't gonna go anywhere. Maybe we manage a cell wagon bank fishery area. Maybe we manage a George's bank fishery area. Maybe we manage based on, on, on habitat features instead because they're not going anywhere even though everything around them is changing. Uh, getting back to what I mentioned before, we may want to think about managing fishery stocks with more of a scalpel than a machete. It's maybe it's not just all one size. We should think about those leaders and those laggards on the stocks a little bit differently and how we can manage them more conservatively to give more resilience overall to the stock. I think this idea of overtly upfront saying, we're gonna keep people fishing as long as we can, or we're gonna cut this all off right now and, and do what we can to support people who were dependent on that fishery to get into a different industry. But I think it, that, that trade-off needs to be addressed upfront. Um, we have given, fishermen licenses to catch fish based on species. Perhaps we should think about an idea like a fisheries passport. You can fish in your area. You can catch whatever's in there at any given point in time. Maybe it's black sea bass today. Maybe it's a lone codfish the other day. Who knows what it might be the following year? Um, again, the, the, the management, the law, and the science probably isn't nimble enough to support that, but I think we need, we need to start thinking about how are we going to keep people out there fishing sustainably uh, and get away from single species, rigid geographic management that just isn't, isn't effective anymore. Finally, another wacky idea. If we can identify which species are more or less vulnerable, Maybe instead of giving fishermen, you know, a, a, a tonnage to catch, or a certain time frame within that they can catch, you give them a certain number of points. It's like when you go to the carnival, and the roller coaster, you know, your parents buy you, you know, or maybe you buy your kids, you know, fifty tickets, and the roller coaster is ten tickets. The carousel is only one ticket. So the kid has to make their decision: Am I going to go on the roller coaster five times, or am I going to go on the carousel fifty times? Uh, so that gives some control to fishermen to make some decisions. You can incorporate some scientific assessment in there about what species you really need to not fish so hard and others that are more uh, capable of withstanding more fishing pressure. So again, we don't really have a system right now that can incorporate that, uh, but I think we need to start thinking creatively um, and get away from the way we've been doing fishery management in the past. That is all I have. It's so strange just talking to myself on the screen. I know there's people out there, but I'm gonna stop sharing. Excellent. Oh, there are people. Look, there's, there's boxes with names on them, yay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. That was a tremendous amount of information. Um, and if folks uh, wanna think about any questions, feel free to add those into the chat box um, to, kind of kick us off, I did jot down one question, um, Susan, is there, um, when you were th thinking about, you know, managing the stock as like one giant group, and I loved kind of the, the visual you created of like the leaders and laggers, is there anywhere, anywhere else in the world where uh, they um, manage fisheries like that? Not that I'm aware of, and the, and the science on that is relatively recent. Um, and when I was initially doing this research a few years ago, it just, I, so I have a bachelor's in science, but I, I'm not a PhD, but that just kind of made sense to me. So I dug really hard. I'm like, I want to find some paper that packs that up. And I finally did. And that's this idea of trailing and leading edges, right? That you got the pioneers and you got the ones bringing up the rear. Um, so I don't think, I don't think that's being widely adopted. I'm not aware of any place that's using it right now. Um, I jotted down the Ocean um, Adapt, uh, the Rutgers um, website. Is there any other resources that if folks really want to, uh, if they're inspired right now to learn more that maybe you could share? Um, we oh do a, a 
follow up email um, after our lectures with the recording and I'd, I'd love to include any any resources. Yeah, there's there's so many and I, I mean having thought about this for a while and studied it and kind of monitoring it like it's, it's it's amazing what is out there right now. I mean even as I was updating this presentation over the last few days, uh, the NOAA fisheries website is fantastic. It's fan I mean it's almost too fantastic like there's so much information in there. Um, I can uh, poke around and maybe give you some more targeted resources or there's some maybe some experts here who could type in a website into the into the chat um ocean adapt is just i don't know i'm kind of a geek about that you can just play with that you pick a you pick a species and it runs the animation you see what's happening with it it's just super cool excellent um and, and those, just uh, oh, type go in ahead, a question Becky. oh thank you um so uh, is there a role for fishermen in collecting uh, data? They always say um, they have information that the scientists don't. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that's been a long, um, a long standing point of contention in fishery management. Um, uh, there, there certainly can be a role, and there have been different efforts made to engage fishermen in scientific research and similarly to engage scientists in what fishermen are seeing. Um, I think we can probably use more of that, if for nothing else, to enhance cooperation and mutual understanding and respect. Uh, part of the problem with that, it, it, you, you run into pretty quickly, you know, scientists operate on a very different headspace than fishermen do. And it makes sense, right? If you're a scientist, you want to go to the same place and repeat what you did over a series of time it's because that keeps it pure, right? You're not, you're not being opportunistic. Opportunistic is the definition of a fisherman. They go where the fish are. So the fishermen may not be you know, wrong in saying, I'm seeing so many codfish out there. You guys aren't, you, you're just not seeing them. Part of what we think happened with, with, with cod when fishermen were saying 20 years ago, like I'm seeing all these codfish out in Stella Wagon Bank. Yeah, you are. They're all contracted there. They're, that's that's they're one of their last places. So sure, there's a lot of fish out there. Is that reflective of the condition of the stock overall? That's the question. So I think even, you know, just bridging that sort of understanding of what, what that opportunistic data that fishermen are seeing and collecting, how that compares to a statistically sound, you know, set of trawl data over decades, how those work together. But it, it, we're gonna need all the data we can going into this. So bring it on. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and then I had, uh, another question, as long as there's not another one in the, the chat there, um, just thinking about, you know, individual, individual actions or, you know, more community-wide actions, or I'm just thinking of, you know, Celt's role as a community organization, mm -hmm. you know, is there anything we can do to, you know, support our local fisheries and decision makers as they're trying to kind of navigate uh, these different changes? Wow. So I, I mean, climate, climate change is just such a, I don't know about you all, but it's, I mean, it's affecting me like right now, like right here today, but it's also so big. I think in terms of being somebody who loves the coast, who lives on the coast or is a member of an organization like Kelp, I, I think scale is going to get really important. And I don't know about you all, but, um, you know, the pandemic has certainly taught me about being close to home. Um, and appreciating a smaller scale and not relying on my cat's favorite food to come on the truck from wherever it comes from. Because let me tell you, I can't find science diet cat food anywhere. The shelves are bare. So, okay, maybe I need to go out and, you know, hunt some rabbit for them or something. I don't know, but um, that, that's being a little bit silly. I, I do think that thinking how you can support local fishermen, there's less carbon emissions when the truck and the plane aren't coming from far away to bring you your, your seafood. Being engaged, and I always, always 
this is a struggle when teaching college students because you want to convey to them the urgency of the problems that they're facing without completely depressing them, right? Um, so I always tell them when they, they get totally overwhelmed by climate change, oh, you know, US isn't doing anything, the UN's working too slow. Look, look at the smaller scale. Um, towns and communities are doing a lot. I'm not as familiar with the Kennebec Valley area, but South Portland and Portland have some uh, uh, pretty active climate council activities. The Maine Climate Council issued a lot of recommendations. I would encourage people to follow them and their activities in the marine sector. Um, so look, look local if you want to do something or if you're feeling bummed out, because I think there's more, there's more going on and that may, that's a more manageable scale for most of us anyway. Excellent. Well, it is 7.01. Um, I'll do a last call for any questions or comments for folks might have. And um, if not, I think we will wrap it up there. Susan, thank you so much again. Um, everyone else, we will be following up with an email with tonight's recording um, and some additional resources. And everyone have a really lovely evening and, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Becky. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in, even though I couldn't see you. <laughs> Take care.